Hello, uh, welcome to today's webinar all about photo engraving. Today I'm going to be covering six tips which hopefully are going to help you with photo engraving and give you a better start with this application. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a little live video, or not a little, a little video, and it's going to give you a better idea about the actual process and what we're looking at doing. And then we're going to follow up with a presentation where we'll go into some more detail about exactly how to do it. So let's bring up the presentation and we'll now start with the short video. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a little bit of a better idea about just what is possible with photo engraving. And now we're going to start with tip one, which is all about helping you try and understand the best way to find a setting for photo engraving. Now, sometimes I think that photo engraving is a bit of a misleading term. So if we look at traditional engraving, so we're having a look at the actual engraving mark itself, what we traditionally try to do is we try to go for quite a deep mark which creates a nice amount of contrast and this is a great effect and it's especially useful for doing things like your basic text. However, when we actually use this method, when we aim for this area here and we actually fire the laser here, we actually input a lot of energy in order to get this depth and quite often that will then result in an engraving mark that's actually quite a bit wider than where we're targeting the laser. Now, if you think when we're working with a photo, we're trying to target lots of little pixels and lots of little data. Now, if each of these pixels starts to spread, they start to overlap and we actually lose a lot of quality from the actual engraving itself. So when you're trying to find your laser setting, think of it more as laser marking. So what we're trying to do is add just enough power that the actual material starts to change color. So here we have an example, of obviously, some more power in the deep engraving and here, a much lighter power and actually marking. However, we will cover this. There are actually other tricks and tips you can use to, of course, try and bring out some of the contrast in the material. So if we have a look at this little example here, we've got a nice comparison of two different powers. So here we have quite clearly something that is underpowered. So we can't see much of the image coming through at all. And here we actually have something that's probably slightly overpowered. And the reason I say that is if we look at the contrast between the upper surface here and the hat, you can see that we cannot actually see any definition. And again, that's because having too much power makes all of those pixels start to overlap. And then we start to actually re result in a worse quality engraving. So we understand that we now need to add just enough power in order to create a nice contrasting mark. However, 
we then need to look at the actual picture itself. And this may not sound like a tip, but the thing behind this is a bad picture will result in a bad engraving. So it doesn't matter if we spend lots of time trying to get everything set up perfectly. If we have a very poor quality image, we simply can't get a very good result. So if we have a look at this example on the left here, we have the same image and then two close up shots. And it's quite obvious that if we have a high quality image, we simply have a lot more pixel data and therefore a lot more clarity. So when the laser tries to process an image, it looks at the different colors that are on there. And as you can see on here, we have a lot of different gray tones. So what will happen is the laser will still try to add power here. It will engrave here as well. And essentially we end up with a big blurry blob. Whereas if we use with and start with a much higher quality image, then the laser is going to be able to differentiate between the whiter background and the black text. And that's going to give us a lot more clarity to our engraving. So in terms of the image size, it's very apparent that a lot of customers quite often will send you things that they've simply downloaded from the internet. Now, in order to make websites and web pages run fast, typically these files will be of very low quality. So don't be scared in going back to the potential customers and asking, do you have a high quality image? And quite often they will actually have an example of the same image, but at a much better quality. We also need to take into consideration just general photographic rules. But of course, this is all as well down to interpretation. So, for example, if the image has very poor lighting, then the laser will not be able to see any of this contrast here at all, and we simply will not get a good result. If the image is out of focus, again, we're not going to get a good result. So when you're looking at photos for engraving with a laser, what we really need is good contrast. So good contrast between the highs and the lows. And if you have an image that is actually out of focus, and we're not going to get that definition, and therefore the image itself from the laser will, of course, be blurry. And again, if we have a look at exposure, we can see that this image here is quite obviously overexposed. And I would expect all of this complete region here to essentially have not really much definition in it at all. So we will, of course, send a follow up and we'll send you some additional information after this webinar. And here we can also see a basic guide to some rough table sizes for the image size that you're looking to engrave versus the actual file size. And generally, you'll find that you won't really get files that are much bigger than a couple of megabytes from the Internet. So again, it's looking for proper sources for the images, which will have all of that data and allow you just to get that much more of a better result from your machine. So we found just the right power to change the color of the material. And then we've also made sure that we have an image that's suitable. Now we have to look at how we can get that image across to the machine itself. So. Quite often, people think that we're actually working with a grayscale image and a relief type mode. However, this is, although this creates a really good effect, if we have a look at the image here, what this mode will do is it will actually vary the power across the graphic. So where the graphic is black, it will have the most power, and where it's gray and lighter, it will have less power. Now, the big problem with this is, is that we're then going to end up with too much power, which again is going to result in less quality, and then we're going to have very low power areas where we won't get any contrast at all. So this isn't the method for working with photos. What we want to do is we want to take a photo and we want to convert it to a raster type pattern. Now, if you're lucky enough to already be a Trotec user, we do have these built into our printer driver. But it is possible to also manually do this with all of the commonly available graphics packages. So let's have a look at what's happening. So in this example here, we have these dark regions over here and the lighter regions over here. And what's going to happen is simply it's going to group little dots and it's going to increase the density to give the effect of darker tones throughout the image. So if we have a look at the example over here, you can see at the top where we have a very dark image, we have lots of these dots and they're very densely populated. And then as we go down, we go to the lighter region. Now, the reason this is why we work with photos in this way is because then we end up with a graphic for the laser that's only made of black and white data. So it means when the laser fires, it's going to use that setting we found where it gives us a nice amount of contrast. And where obviously the laser's not firing, we'll obviously have the natural material left over. 
So let's have a quick look at doing this with the job control software, just to give you an idea of exactly how this is working. So I'm going to bring up one of the graphics that I worked with earlier, and then hopefully we can get an idea of exactly what we're trying to do. So over here on the left hand side is the original image. And then over here on the right hand side is the image after I've made some adjustments. So this is all about some little further tweaks that you can do to try and improve the quality. So if we zoom in on the hair here, you can see that we can actually see some highlights and extra brighter tones here. But overall, there is still a lot of dark image data here, which means that we can't see these very well. And if we then compare that to the modified image, you can see that we've managed to get rid of some of the dark data. And then what that does is that allows us to see a lot more of the tones and it will allow the laser to pick up on the actual quality there. So let's have a look at doing that. So we'll just take the original image and then we'll paste another version across. And then we first of all, we're going to go up to effects, go to adjust, and we're going to look at the contrast. So this is why quite often, if you do have the availability to work with a HDR type image, you will have to do a lot less post-processing and a lot less fine-tuning to the actual image itself. So on here, we're just going to click Reset, and then we can zoom in on a region of detail. So in here, we have two different options. So in here, we have the input data. So this is the data that's coming from the actual image itself. And here, we have the darker tones, and here, we have the lighter tones. So what we want is a high dynamic range. What that means is basically we want data that comes all the way across the spectrum of the color range. So by adjusting this slightly, what it will do is it will just make sure that we're working with as much image data as possible. And now we come to the output. So in this case, as already discussed, we don't want all of the dark gray tones that are in here and covering up some of the highlights. So by compressing the actual data that's left in the image, you can see we can actually start to brighten this and get an image that we can actually start to work with a lot more. So although this looks quite washed out, you need to forget in terms of what the image looks like for print quality. So an image that looks good for printing might not necessarily be the best thing for working with a laser and vice versa. So again, we can also have a look at the highlights and the high tones here. And again, if this was overexposed, again, you could come in here and start to reduce this a little bit which would then allow there to be a bit more data. So with that adjusted, the next thing we're going to look at is sharpening the actual image. So under here, we have an unsharp mask tool. And again, this is available in a range of different graphics software. And what we have here is the ability to create greater contrast between the highs and the lows. And that's really what helps the laser give you a nice defining image. So if we have a look up here, we have the percentage, so how much of the image it's going to look at working with. I like to increase this slightly. And then we have the ability to change the radius. So this is the size of the dot of the contrast. So increasing this will create a bigger gap between the highs and the lows. So you can see as we increase this, it starts to really dramatically adjust and affect the image. Now, again, as I've already mentioned, this might not look great for print, but it will be really good for helping the laser work with the image. So one final note is also on here is I've cropped the image. And this is, again, back at looking at the image quality. As we can see, this region here is quite out of focus and it's quite blurry. So what I did for the final image was I cropped it down. And again, that meant that we were already left with good image data. So from this point, we would just go to File and we'll go to Print. And it will select selection. And then in here on the settings, the main thing we're focusing on today is the photo optimization settings. So we can click this from the drop down. Here we can then vary the resolution. So for better uh, quality materials, so materials which will give you greater contrast, you can have a higher DPI. So for your plastics, I might leave it around the 500 mark. And if you're working with materials like woods, then you might want to try it around the 300. And the next thing we need to now choose is the actual pattern itself. So here, the main two ones I use are between these two. So order differing, I find, gives the most image detail. And the Stuckey pattern gives more contrast. So generally, I'll try and always work with order differing. But if you're working with a material like wood, and you might want a bit more contrast, 
then I'd recommend also trying one of the others. So from there, we then print the file across. And then if I bring up job control, we can then have a look at the actual graphics themselves. And so if I open up the filter at the top here, we can then bring the job on. And then we can zoom up and we can have a look. And you can see now what's happened is our laser printer driver has then converted it to this raster pattern and it's converted it to just simply black and white dot data. And this is what will give us the best result. It's also quite useful to preview the image like this. As, as you can see, we don't have any data across here. So it also gives you another chance to quickly view the job before you finally run it. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea about how to take a photo and get it across to the laser itself. So next, let's have a quick look at the actual materials themselves. So when you're choosing the material, especially when you're considering different sized products, you need to consider, does the material provide enough contrast? So materials that provide lots of contrast, so over here on the left, are things like the trolleys material. So when we engrave through the top layer, we get the nice contrasting layer underneath. And then also anodized aluminium is another great material to work with. If we then want to work with other materials, we can obviously look at things like acrylics. So that, of course, depends on the backing color and also things like painted metal. And then finally, things that can be a little bit more tricky to engrave can be materials like wood, although it does give a really nice effect. And of course, there are other little tricks that you can play to try and further enhance the contrast. But it just shows that even with the same image across different material, you can get quite drastically different results. So it really is worth trying different materials. So tip number five is kind of in combination with tip number four of choosing the materials, also considering the actual size of the job that you're trying to create. So if you want to work with a smaller type graphic, then you may want to pick a material that provides more contrast. Whereas if you're working with a much larger product and graphic, then again, that opens you up really to work with a lot more different materials. So it's just worth considering the actual material choice with the size of the product that you're trying to create. And also, it's really worth taking the time to experiment. So here are just some quick little tests I did. And in this case, I actually had a lacquer on this particular wood. And then I just thought after I'd done the normal engraving, we just do a little bit of paint fitting using some acrylic paint. And you can see how we can actually create different kinds of contrast just by letting the actual paint absorb into the exposed wood. Now, I don't particularly have the ability myself, but if you are skilled and you're an artist, then I could imagine that you could very quickly start to actually paint in fill into here and create some very interesting effects. And again, over here with the smaller type graphic, I've added it and we can see that it's brought out again some more of the contrast. And you can also consider doing it the other way. So rather than paint filling, you can actually have a veneered layer or a painted layer on top and then engrave a way to expose the natural material underneath. So. There are lots of different effects that you can create, and I think this is a very important thing as well when trying to create a unique product is also working with a wide variety of materials to really try and get the best result. So tip number six is all about then finally making sure that your machine is set up perfectly to get the best result from the actual job itself. So these are all the basics that you would do anyway, but they become even more critical when we're just trying to fire at individual pixels to get different results. So for example, is the material in focus? And of course, hand in hand with that is, is the material flat. So especially if you're working with material like wood, you can find it will come out of focus. It will then move up into a region where the beam's wider. And again, we'll lose a lot of data and a lot of quality from the image itself. So these are things which do matter when you're doing your basic engraving, but become even more important when you're trying to work with photos. The next thing to consider as well is if you really are looking to do this a lot, is also making sure you have the best lens and the best setup. In which case, I'd recommend that you work with the one and a half inch lens here. So this will give you a much smaller spot size and allow you potentially to get a lot more clarity from the engraving itself. So it is worth experimenting with. And that's what I used for all of the samples that I produced for the video and for today. Next up, you also need to consider is your extraction set up and is it 
working well enough around the engraving. So if you think we're engraving a layer of the material, if you're leaving dirt and debris on the rest of the material that's yet to be engraved, the laser not only has to mark the material, but also now has to remove the debris that's been left on top. So make sure that your extraction is set up sufficiently. The final thing to consider is, do you need to run the machine at maximum speed? So if you think when the laser head is firing across the material, especially on the machines like the 400, where we're over four meters a second now, it's got to pulse on and off extremely fast. And you can still get a very good result, but you can also find that actually if you just reduce the speed slightly, it will still give you actually some improvements depending on the actual material that you're working with. So somewhere, depending on obviously the machine and the actual speed, I would still be probably over a meter a second, but it's worth just doing a little bit of experimentation to see if it actually helps bring up some of the data from your engraving. So just as a quick recap, tip one is all about marking the material and not engraving it. So what we're doing for any of the material you want to work with, keep adding a little bit of power until you're just getting a nice amount of contrast. Don't go over the top and engrave it too deeply because then you're going to start to lose some of the quality. Tip number two is really about using a suitable image. So that's really knowing when to tell the customer no. And that really comes from experience and practice. But you don't need something incredible to get started and start practicing with, but it's worth knowing what to look for. Tip number three, of course, is making sure you're using a raster type pattern. So whether you're using the printer controller with our job control software or whether you're manually doing it, but you want to make sure you use a raster pattern. Next, you need to make sure that the material you're working with does actually provide you that contrast that you need to get a good result. And again, that's hand in hand with making it sure that it matches your product size. So use a material that's going to give you a high contrast for smaller products. And if you're working with bigger products, it doesn't really matter as much. And then finally, tip number six is, of course, to make sure that your machine is set up perfectly and optimized as well as possible. Thank you, obviously, for watching. We're now going to go to the questions and answer. And if you are watching this live, then please do contact us via our website, and then we'll be sure to get back to you and to help you where possible. So I'm now going to bring in one of my colleagues, Brian Jata, and then we're going to start looking at some of the questions that you may have. Good afternoon, Brian. Good afternoon. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing that, Alex. That was uh, very informative. No problem. So let's have a quick look. And I think we haven't really got many questions at the moment. So I don't know if anyone's still watching has any questions. And we can obviously answer away. Or does anything you'd like to add at all, Brian? Uh, well, we've got one question, which comes from uh, LaserTech Botswana. So thanks for joining us from uh, all the way over there. Um, and they've asked, uh, we found that, that photo engraving of dark skinned people is not the same as for lighter skinned people. Uh, any tips regarding that? So a lot of it is going to come down to the actual contrast between the foreground and the background. So it's making sure it depends on the actual lighting. And this really comes back, not really to do with the actual laser itself, but it really comes back down to photography tips. So quite often you'll find things like the contrast and actual lighting are more important when you're trying to create a really nice captured image. And it's really about that side of improving the initial photo rather than the actual laser stage. OK, and we've got a question from Mark Tolbert, which says, uh, any tips to use in glass, uh, particularly on the rotary attachment? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, go for I'll, it, take, I'll take that. OK. <laughs> um, Obviously, glass is one of the more difficult um, substrates to uh, etch a photo into, uh, mainly because it, it doesn't hold that detail particularly well. It's, essentially, you are uh, shattering the surface of the glass, so your spot size tends to become a bit bigger. Um, so if I want to put a photograph onto glass, I will generally be taking away as much detail out of that photograph as possible. And um, whilst Alex mentioned uh, how you can adjust um, photographs in um, in Corel and Illustrator and, and things like that, there's also actually a few handy apps that you can use 
Um, I use one called Pencil Sketch quite often. I find it useful specifically for uh, doing photographs on glass because you take your photograph, you run it through Pencil Sketch, and it literally takes out most of the detail um, and provides you with a pencil sketch. But when you then laser it, uh, it comes out really nicely on those substrates that don't hold the detail very well. Uh, so I would definitely have a look at that. You got anything to add, Alex? Um, I think you're exactly right. So especially if you are using like a manual conversion, you can specify kind of how big the gaps are between the dots. So that's the kind of method I would look at doing. And then, as Brian said, make sure there's not too much data because otherwise you end up with a lot of overlap and you'll, yeah, you won't get all of that detail that you want. Okay, so we've got a question from uh, Raz Woolard. Uh, can you paint wood with acrylic paint and remove material, or do you need special substrates? Um, I think you can just use pretty much any paint. It's just a case of then making sure that your power setting is set correctly, that you're not then over modifying the surface, so you're not creating too much damage to the surface. Another tip I quite often use is if you can paint it in advance, then I'll add actual further protection to it, so whether that's like a low-tack tape. Um, it again can just help concentrate the laser energy into removing the material rather than spreading too much. Yeah, I think if you paint, if you are painting uh, the surface of the wood first, uh, you literally only need to remove uh, that that surface of paint away to generate a good contrast. So you're you're going to make life, if anything, you're going to make life easier for yourself by doing that. Um, but of course, you've then not got a product that looks like a natural piece of wood. Okay. Uh, okay, John Paul Benford has asked, uh, I currently have a Speedy 100. I presume I can get the results you showed from that for photos. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Um, and, if you, and if you are, if you are struggling, um, then speak to your local, um, your local rep or speak to your local office uh, and they can run it through you, uh, run it through with you one on one. Um, what we've tried to give is a, an overview today, uh, a very basic overview because it's a it's it's quite a detailed subject and you can go into it in a huge amount of detail. Uh, and it's also it's also something where if you engrave a photograph and Alex engraves a photograph, um, everyone might have a different opinion on which looks better. Uh, it's very very subjective subject on what what the best result is. So talk to your local office and and. They will help you. Okay, I think we have another message back from Laser Tech Botswana. And in answer to this, um, really, we'd need to probably have a look at the image. So, of course, we should have your details for obviously attending today's webinar. So, we can obviously maybe look at making contact with you and then we could have a look at exactly what kind of issues you're running into. Um, but yeah, otherwise, other things that I would recommend as well, which can be a nice easy fix for difficult to work with photos is just using an online HDR filter. So that will try and bring out as much range of color and the different highs and lows just with like a standard process. So you can just upload it, it'll run it through and it will give you a result that might give you a little bit more chance in terms of getting a better result from the images you're getting sent. Okay, we've got a question from Kirsten Bicker. Uh, we're trying to engrave photos on sterling silver using a speed marker uh, rather than a flatbed, and we found that the mark making is very faint. Uh, not a massive surprise because it's not, it's not a high contrast um, substrate. I mean, this, we don't use sterling silver a huge amount, but you tend to, it's, it's not like you make it go black. So you've not got a black image on a silver background. Um, so it will always likely be fairly faint. Um, Alex, anything to... Um, I think the other thing to consider as well, when you're using a speed marker, so a Galvo type system, the actual dot size as well you're going to have from the laser is very large compared to what we have with our flatbed systems. So again, you're going to need to make sure that you cut down the image data so that you don't have too much overlap as well. Um, so that's really going to going to be it. And if you've if you've managed to cut down that image data uh, enough, so again, I'd refer back to maybe something like pencil sketch. Um, uh, then you can you've got the ability to potentially hit your substrate harder with the laser to go deeper and try and create more of a contrast because you're putting less dots down. You can make each of those dots a bit deeper. 
so hopefully that will help all right let's have a quick look through what we've got we've got a few more comments but i can't see any more questions we'll give, it, we'll give it a minute or two yeah. i was just going to say if people would like a separate webinar really going into detail on maybe just taking or working with one or two photos prior to sending it to the machine then of course um you can obviously contact us and request that and then obviously we can look at potentially doing that as well there is also another uh, very detailed analysis as well by some of our colleagues from america so if you have a search for photo engraving on the trotech channels you'll see that and it could also be worth having a watch of that as well if you want to pick up some extra tips yeah good point there are there's uh, lots of details on lots of different uh, engraving subjects already out there on uh, YouTube. So search the Trotec channels, um, but we'll continue to try and bring you fresh, uh, uh, fresh content as often as we can. Uh, but I think that's that's probably it by the looks of it. Everyone's gone quiet on the chat, which is good. So hopefully we've answered the questions. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for viewing today. And of course, if you have any further questions, you can, of course, contact us. And yep, and then we've also got a comment that's come in about looking at the separate class for looking at the photo. So yep, we'll have a look at that. And then, of course, we can hopefully bring some more uh, tips and obviously help you get better results from your machines. Yeah, J uh, J John Paul Benford, yeah, if you, if you contact uh, your local um, office, then we'll get somebody you can have uh, you can have a bit of time just one-on-one -on -one with somebody uh, and see if we can help out with uh, with getting it to where you want it to be yep. in which case thank you all for viewing and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon please follow us on facebook youtube subscribe to our youtube channel twitter all the rest of those things uh, just to make sure that we can keep you fully up to date all right all right thanks very much everybody